It's so quiet. I, I was like waiting on the music. I don't hear it. Wait, so the music's still not playing? No, you I don't are hear on it. mute. So I, I I chose jazz, a nice jazz selection. You know, I wanted us to come on into the sweet <laughs> sounds of Ella Fitzgerald and Sarah Vaughn. Should I start getting and scatting? It don't oh my God. if it ain't about that swing. Shoot it that up. feels very yeah. Cleveland. Yeah. See? Boom. Look at there. That is ordained. And y'all know I believe in divine intervention. Look at there. Hey, Amen. Amen. Um, They're going to cancel us, B, please. Oh, yeah. Stop. Sorry. Sorry. I don't need <laughs> to talk about divine intervention or anything. Let it <laughs> that go. Don't make everybody uncomfortable. <laughs> So while everyone's filtering in, um, re- there we go. We have, have them in the house. I've sent the coaches the invites. Still waiting on a few more. Um, but we are we are excited that you all have decided to join us again on this beautiful Tuesday as we approach the final four. Um, I guess to go ahead and you know get a few little things started before we get into the introductions. How does everyone feel about, you know, the Elite Eight and Sweet 16 games that we witnessed over the weekend? That was the best Elite Eight in NCAA tournament history, men's or women's. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Spicy. <laughs> this one got a little I, I mean, too. it was, yeah. Uh, the, com- like, the competition, um, the balance between the two te- all the teams going against one another, like, everything felt like a dogfight. It was it was just fun to watch. Bringing everybody else up, everybody else up. Can you all still hear me, Dolores, Yana? Yes. Okay, making sure. Can you hear me, Dolores? Yes. Okay, can you yes, hear me? I can. Okay. Yeah. I think for as much as we say, like individual stars and like all that, like. Every team had other people that showed up. Like, if you watch NC State, like, the story is typically Sanaya. James came out and was like, I'm that girl. Like, if you watch Southern Cal, like, Forbes showed up beside Juju. If you watch South Carolina, Tessa and Ashlyn. If you watch Iowa, a falter showed up. Like, some others really showed up that I think made it that much more interesting. For me, so I was excited about the non superstars, um, just as much as I was about the superstars. How about you, Low Shade? <clears throat> what y'all think about the weekend? Um, it was really dope. Um, I'm glad to see people tuning in, breaking like like record making numbers. That's really dope. I think um, the product has always been good, but the fact that people are finally tapping in to see it. You know, it can be a little irritating because they be saying some wild stuff. It is really dope just to see. Um. Well, you know my usual intro for Juju. I won't say it because we got company. <laughs> no, but yes, you can because she still did her thing. Like she, she definitely did. She did what she needed oh, no, to do. I'm so proud of her. I'm proud of that team. I'm glad I went to Portland. Like the amount of people that turned up that just were like, "Hey." I don't have a team. I just want to watch basketball. It was really dope to see. That's good. That's good. Has the um has the the uh not the building fund committee, but has the auto audio and visual ministry um gotten a successful confirmation from one of our other guests? <laughs> Let me ask Jazz. I'll message her. <laughs> or or we can do a sermonic selection. <laughs> from the youth quiet, the sun being quiet. But yeah, I think overall this weekend was very exciting. It was great to see, like I said, uh, like what, 12.3, I think was the number of the average viewers for the game, one of the games last night. And like women's basketball is here. Women's basketball has always been here, but the rest of them are just getting here. So we knew what the product was and we're excited. So now that you have been listening and watching, we just hope that you all stay along because basketball doesn't stop in April. It's, it's pretty much year round, you know, follow us to the W season, of course. And then we watch, watch those ladies do their thing. Is he in here yet? I'll, I'll scan. We can all scan until we okay. see him. Maybe make, maybe make low a co-host so that she can check. Gotcha. Too. 
All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started um, with this particular panel today. We are excited to have some of our uh, favorite coaches um, be a part of this uh, special spaces today. And <clears throat> welcome to the committee stage. First, we're going to go with an uh, introduction of the newly crowned head coach at Utah State. Welcome almost to the West Coast, Mr. Wesley Brooks, excuse me, head coach. Wesley Brooks, we thank you. Um, if you all don't know Wesley Brooks, of course he had an amazing he's had an amazing career. Every stop he's been, he's won. Um, starting all the way as a graduate assistant back at West Virginia, through his time at Michigan, um, and, and and more recently he's been at Ohio State. And they you know they made it all the way to the Sweet Sixteen and the Elite Eight last year. So. We, we really just uh, appreciate you, Coach Brooks, for, for spending some time with us today. And welcome to Sage. How are you? Uh, uh, can y'all hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, man, yep. I love you guys, man. I think this is the best thing on Twitter. I, I get a kick out of you. I, I, I got to be quiet during the season. You know, it's kind of one of those things. But I, I, me and D, we, we always DM each other. And, and I, just, I think the, the analysis here is, is passionate. and Sometimes people don't like it, but it's kind of on point. And I, I kind of told D uh, at uh, like after our season, I said, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't, you were, you were on point, and I wanted to prove you wrong. But sometimes, <laughs> uh oh, did he go out? Yeah, I think he went out for a second. <laughs> Do a good job. Coach Brooks, are you still there? There you go. We we got him. Can you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. I just say I just think this is excellent. I just love I just love listening to you guys. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're gonna go next to uh, one of my good friends, <clears throat> the thorn in my side. She doesn't answer my FaceTime calls all the time because she's always probably at Chipotle or somewhere else. Um, this is. One of my favorite people in the whole world, Coach Adria Crawford, assistant coach at George Washington University, a part of the last week 16 team at George Washington. You know, they played in the, the, the real Big East back in the day against the likes of the Skyler Diggins and the Maya Moores and the Dev Peters and all of those people. Adria Crawford, how are you? How are you? Thank you for joining the stage today. Um. One, I hope that was recorded. It is recording, so let me just get a clip of that, okay? Because B does not tell me that often, so I just need to hear that. Wes, what's up? Congratulations. Very proud of you. Obviously, we've been going through this a, a long time. Very proud of you. was really happy to see um, you get your chance, and so I'm excited to see what you do out there. Thank you so much. But I'm also excited to be here, so, um, you know, B, thank you for the invite. I love what you guys do. I think it brings a different perspective to women's basketball um, that's really needed. And I know that was the intention of the committee. And so you guys just keep doing it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we're also going to have some few other guests on once our auxiliary board helps um, our um, other guests, we'll bring them in and probably some few surprises too from other coaches to come in and give their perspective on things. So um, I guess we're going to get right into it and go to the um, Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight matchups. Um, talking about things that, you know, things that you saw or what stood out to you. Um, and we're, we're I guess for time purposes, we're just going to do like an Elite Eight recap. So the first game up, we're going to do uh, North Carolina State versus Texas. Um, there were some big moments during that game. Um, I think that was definitely a game of the guards. Some really, really, really exciting guard play there. And specifically, Isaiah James, um, Madison Booker also. And then we know that there was a little fluffle with the measurement on the court. With the, the, the three-point line, I don't know who didn't bring out their stencils or their protractors or whatever and got the measurements on the court right, but we knew that some things could possibly, you know, been done a lot better there in Portland. So what is your thoughts overall on those games? Yeah, no, um, I thought that was, to me, that that I thought the game might be one of the close ones. It turned out 
to not be, but I think it was because of the clash of styles and NC State's guards went out. Like, you knew that they were the X factor in that game, and you knew that Texas Bigs could be the X factor on their side. Um, but literally, Texas backcourt outside of Madison Booker could not do anything with any of the guards um, on NC State. And typically, like, they do eventually come back to earth when they're shooting that well. They did not come back to earth. Um, and I think that's kind of what where the game ended because if Texas, Texas is not a team that can come back, you know, like they don't they don't get out in transition. They very much are a half court team. Um, it's Madison Booker or bust type of thing. Um, and so when that when a team like that goes down by double digits early, eh, I don't you know, it's really hard for them to come back. Um, so, yeah, I was really impressed with James. Um, she, she, we've seen flashes of her hooping like that all season, um, but to do it at the biggest stage, especially considering NC State has been around the Elite Eight, around the Final Four for a few years, um, but they've not been able to get over the hump. So for them to get over the hump with a team that really wasn't even supposed to be there, they were not even ranked to start the season. Um, I thought it was really impressive to see um, NC State do it in this season, given um, all that they um, came into the season without. I'm um, also really happy for Sanaya um, getting back to a Final Four with her new team. So that's my take on that game. Yeah, I, I mean, speed speed kills, man. They came out running. Like, NC State, you can tell the game plan from the jump was to just get out and go. And... I don't think Texas had the speed to stay with them. And I think it took them by surprise a little bit. Like, um, I, yeah, I think it took them by surprise and it took them a while to settle down. Um, Vic made a change at halftime and he went zone. And I think the zone did eventually, you know, slow NC, NC State down a little bit. But it didn't really matter because when a big shot needed to be made, Isaiah James made it happen. And... I also think that Texas, because of how quick the game was going, Texas couldn't take advantage of what they could do, which was get paint points. I thought Aaliyah Moore struggled a little bit in that game. She got some really nice touches in the paint, and she couldn't get the ball to go down. Um, I thought Gatston also struggled to get some shots to go down, and so the lead just kind of kept growing and growing. But Madison Booker played well for a freshman um, on that stage. She played really well, but Isaiah James was just – she was just too much. And how about from our – I want uh, – go, uh, go ahead. We're, we're waiting to get some of the others on the stage. Um, and then for the coaches, definitely feel free to interject as well. You know, that's why we're here today. So give your insight on these games, anything that st stuck out to you while you were watching as well. Oh, well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the controversy. Like, how do you play five – I mean, you have shoot-arounds. And you play four or five games, and they got to the fifth game, and they just discovered the court was messed up. And I don't, I just, that kind of was shocking to me. I just didn't understand how that, how that could happen, especially when, you, well, like you know, just for people who don't understand the process of preparing for an NCAA game, uh, the the all the teams go in there and they do a shoot around, and then after they do their shoot around, uh, they go and and then they play the games, and then they do another shoot around, and so for. That did not get caught until game number five after all the shooting rounds. It was crazy to me. But that was my thoughts on just that. I have a question for the coaches. Would you play the game if you knew the line was messed up? Because I, I saw Vic's response, um, and he said they were afraid of losing the window, um, the ABC window, and so they decided to go ahead with it. But for me, when I, I'm not a coach, but for me, I was just like, I don't know. I probably would have just like lost the window at that point because I feel like in basketball, there's so many things that you can't control. The things that you should be able to control needs to be perfect. I, I think, and I, people might not agree with me, but you got to shoot on both baskets. <laughs> so you're going to get a chance to shoot a little closer in one half. Now, the problem would be, like, which team gets to shoot closer first? Because I right. think in the second half, I'd want to be shooting closer. 
So I think that would be like, let's do a coin toss and maybe we flip benches and then we can see who gets to shoot at the closer one first. Um, but I would just, I, I think it's really, it's disappointing. I agree with Wes. Like, I think it's disappointing um, that, that on such a large stage, right. in in a slot where we have ABC ready to watch the game, ready for so many people who have been excited about women's basketball all season, that this is a, um, you know, a, a an event that's uh, that that's occurring. That there's a difference, there's a discrepancy on the court that should have been measured a long time ago because so many people have played on the courts. There have been shoot arounds. There have been all of this. Um, but it's like let's just ball. Like we, we, we'll figure it out and let's do a coin toss and whoever gets whoever gets it gets to pick which basket they shoot on and play the game. Um, question is, I saw, um, I think Baylor's head coach mentioned that they shot better, um, in the second half of their game on that same court. Do, do coaches, it's for coaches, do you guys think it had a psychological, like, do you think that played into anything on either side of the floor for either team? I I would say, I mean, did they know at that time? Because if they didn't know at that time, then I don't know how. I, I don't think they do. <laughs> so, right. So, I don't think it can be a psychological okay, thing they, until, okay. until, they, until they know, right? But if they knew or if they sensed it, then that would, that's something else. Um, that, that would be my perspective on it, you know. I lean more towards agreeing with Wes. Like, I think it's a psychological thing. Once you find out, um, and then, you know, your team might start thinking about it. But I also think you're at that point, you're like, we just got to figure out how to win. I think you get that deep in the season. And, like, there's not, like, those teams are there for a reason. Those players are are dedicated to their craft. They're working to win. So I, I don't think that that moment where they're like, oh, the, three-point lines are uneven that that was that big of a concern just because of their preparation. And Coach Neighbors, if, if uh, we did, I did send you it up. Oh, there you go. Okay. Well, before, before you speak, let's give you a, your proper introduction. <laughs> no. <clears throat> hold up. Hold up. Wait, wait. I, let Wesley do it. I want to hear Wesley. Okay, go ahead, Wes. Go ahead, Wes. You do it. Go ahead, Wes. Mike Neighbors, Final Four at the University of Washington. Coach's dream mentor, mentors, uh, <laughs> bourbon connoisseur, uh, out of the box thinker. All right, all right, one of that's the good. Brightest that's good. Minds in our sport. Congrats, Mike brother! Neighbors. I'm happy for you. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. You're gonna knock it out of the park. I, I was hoping for a little bit more introduction about tonight. We were playing, and you were at Utah, and Plum got 57, and you were calling out oh, every play we were yeah. running. <laughs> I, oh, that, I was that. hoping about that night when you I'd call a play, and you'd yell the action, and Plum would still go score. Yeah, yeah. Well, so <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me tell everybody about that night. So go. It, this, this is so funny. This is so funny. And I I, I think about that, and Mike, Mike would point at me, and I was pointing back at him. It was great. That's awesome. Laugh, we, would laugh, we laughed about it. So at, I was at the University of Utah. And it was the game. It was the game. The year they went to the Final Four, and we had a pretty good, decent team. But we actually needed that game to try and make a late season push. And so uh, he had Chantel Osahor, and he had get some foul trouble. Chelsea. Chantel and got I, in foul trouble. Yeah, and and but this is the thing. I had that scout, Mike, and the game plan. And the game plan was, hey, stop, like stop everybody else, but let Kelsey get hers. I know. Well, at that point, we had never seen, you know, we hadn't seen the people like Clark and stuff doing that. Like, getting hers means you get 25, you get 30. We didn't expect her to get 57 and break the record, so that was a bad scout. She, <laughs> hey, if Chantel don't get in foul trouble that night, we don't, she doesn't need to do that. She had 27 in a row. No, yeah, I wish that had been it, on TV. We had so much fun that night, Wes. I had it, it was, it, mad that respect was, for you, and obviously yeah. that was all in good fun, but, man, we had a good yeah. night that night. No, it it was fun, and it, it's just fun when you you know, and we you, you talk trash with one another, and, and, but that was just fun, right? You know, yeah. we had a game plan. We tried. To... Sorry, lost you guys, lost me. But she played a hell of a game, and it was really really fun. And the environment was great, and so nah, it was uh, great. 
No, yeah, no. it was really good. Then we both end up working for McGuff. I mean, it comes yeah. full circle in this thing. Yeah, man. Yeah, and and McGuff is just—he's so great. He he was so good at preparing me and helping me get to this spot. And much like yourself, Mike, I know he he's he's done a lot. And I think sometimes, you know, I, I'm gonna give Kevin McGuff his his, his flowers. He doesn't get a lot of uh, pub, and he's really quiet, but he's a hell of a coach, and he's a hell of a leader, and he loves to prepare people and empower people and help them get to the next level. No, nah, there's no question. He's the best ever at that. It, uh, You know, I'm, I'm sure it happened to you, too. He'd just walk in and say, you got practice and leave. Wouldn't yeah. leave you a practice schedule. Wouldn't tell you ahead of time. It was like, you got him and sink or swim, and, uh, hey, you got the you got the pr- – uh, you got the radio show tonight. No ego. I mean, yeah. the fact that he finally got coach of the year after all the the different leagues that he's won and all the different great teams. I I told him I said now now you you're off that list. You you're you used yeah. to be the best coach ever that never got coach of the year, but now you're on that list. So but, the, the uh, only thing nah. I regret not getting helping him with is not helping him get to a final four, man. I, and we tried, but uh, that's the only thing I regret. I, he deserves to get to one, and uh, Listen, hopefully here in the next couple of years he's going to get to one. Listen, the final getting to the final four. I, all y'all that have been in that elite that elite eight game is the hardest game there is because yes, you know is. what's next, and it's um, you know it's so special and so rare that uh, anybody that gets there better enjoy it. You don't remember it forever, but uh, now I, I, you know I think it's funny that we're both on here because Kevin has done so much for everybody, but he's such a teacher of the game, and like you said, gets uh, gets lost in the shuffle because he's not uh, he's not out there. Uh, telling people how great he is. My papa neighbors used to always say, if, if you got to go out all the time telling people how good you are, you're probably not very good. Mm-hmm. Um, and Kevin's the, the living, walking example of that. So you're going to be ready, man. You're going to make a bunch of mistakes just like I did. I made I, – <laughs> I, I think everybody out here on this call probably has got my 418 mistakes that I made that first year as a head coach. If you mm-hmm. don't, look me up. I'll email it to you. I wrote a little paper on – the 418 mistakes I did make that first year at Washington, and I continue to make a bunch. But uh, Kevin got us both ready. You're going to make a bunch of them, brother, but you're going to make them going full speed, and uh, you mm-hmm. won't make the same one twice, and that's what it's all about. Well, I appreciate it, Mike. It really means a lot. Thank you. That's what we love. We love these words, and we love coaches being able to pour back into people and, 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 and yeah, all, 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 the, all the goodness. Like, um, Coach West, we are definitely rooting for you out there in Utah. And you all spoke about being good leaders and, and mistakes and all those good things. So that's why we have you all here, because um, we we trust and we appreciate what you all have done as coaches. And so, Coach Neighbors, we always love hearing you speak. And so a question that we asked before you ate, before you came to the stage. Uh, well, first, before we get into that, you caught my attention. Or, or Coach Brooks caught my attention when he mentioned bourbon. Now, here at the committee... We are bourbon enthusiasts. So what's your go-to bourbon, and which one we need to be drinking on? Antique 107 out of Weller's is the one you need to go. That's the purple label. Uh, it's the best bang for your buck, I think. Uh, you can put it up against any ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 bottle. It's about $100 now, hold bottle. Up, now, hold up. <laughs> Wait, Wait a, a minute, minute. <laughs> Coach. We're we not head coaches, so we're not paying that part. You can afford one hundred and seven dollars. Go out, okay, okay, okay. Now that's a little more likable. Okay, okay. <laughs> and save it for a big win, and then you upgrade. I, I used, I used to drink Boone's Farm, so don't get me started on that. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I'm about to say, okay. You, you got to start all. somewhere, but if you you said bang for your buck, a Weller's one hundred and seven. It's an it's a it's a Weller's bottle out of the Weller's style sold now out of you know the Buffalo Trace there in Frankfurt. So. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I think I'm maybe most proud that that Wesley mentioned bourbon enthusiast first, uh, before any of that other stuff. So, <laughs> um, I'm sitting here. I'm in Phil. I'm in Cleveland right now. I'm at the hotel. Uh, we're gonna start <laughs> meetings in the morning. So I'm in Cleveland already for the final four, and uh, I may have, may or may not have one in front of me right now. Well, we, <laughs> listen, for those of us who have been to any of the final four gatherings, we understand what that works, and I can't look. I can't wait to get there myself. But a question that we asked um, okay. to the other coaches on the panel, um, we, we talked about the decision to play um, without rec- really rectifying the court or, you know, giving them the, that space and time. What, as the head coach, what would have been your decision um, when it came to the, the court and the difference um, between the three-point lines? I mean, just the same thing that Wes and Vic did, got together and realized that for the good of the game, it was best to play that game. I mean, I think everybody would have liked for it to have been right, but 
Hey, I'm, I'm sitting here as guilty as anybody else. I watched them four games that were played the day before. I didn't notice it. So, I mean, I, I mean, people may be better. I, I would have liked to have thought if I was in the gym because my staff told me, said, hey, you notice when the rim's one degree off left or right or whatever. But, listen, I mean, there's so many other things on your mind that day. I'm not second-guessing anybody that was there. Uh, there's a lot going on with that. But it was crazy. I mean, it's hard to believe that that is, is fathomable. But I think both parties made the right decision. It would have uh, it would have really detracted, I think, even more so. Uh, somebody mentioned it right when I jumped on here. I'm not sure. I'm sorry which coach was talking. But but she said that, you know, Bo, you got to shoot on both ends and eventually. And, um, you know, it's negligible. Hell, I can't get my team to shoot it at the three-point line. So, hell, it wouldn't have mattered to us. We shoot it like four steps beyond it no matter anyway. So. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know. I, I think, I mean, I, I, the nose ring deal is a bigger deal to me. Cause that, you know, that, that kept her out of some actual live minutes and man, who knows what happens in that whole deal. That was a crazy deal. Cause we played every game with somebody with a nose ring in and to bring it up at that point, I, that was bigger to me than the court, but I'll answer your question by telling you, I think those both, both those guys did the right thing. And I'm not sure there could have been a, a better decision made than that, but, uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it, it brought some attention to our game probably we didn't want, but I thought they handled it as bad best they could. How you respond to stuff? We talk to kids all the time. It's not, you know, that's not something you can tr- can control. So how do you, how do you respond to it? Uh, and I thought both teams did a great job responding to it. Okay, I appreciate that. And that was uh, one game that Friday, and we're going to go to the other Elite Eight game, which was between South Carolina and Oregon State. Some of the key takeaways from that game, uh, Tessa Johnson, um, not as heralded of a rookie, of course, uh, or a freshman. Um, she doesn't get the lights and the stats like uh, Malaysia Fulwally or some of the other freshmen in the country. The defense of Ashlyn Watkins. Um, some questions around officiating, depending on, you know, what side you were leaning. And then um, Beers versus Camilla. I think that was a matchup that everyone was really w- looking forward to seeing. And then um, we've seen in recent games where South Carolina, they've allowed larger leads to uh, diminish. So for those of you here, um, we'll start with some of the coaches first. What were some of your takeaways? Uh, we'll start with the coaches first. Excuse me. What were some of your takeaways during that particular game? And what stood out to you in those moments? I, I didn't like to kind of – I was kind of with the, everybody else with the, the fouls and the – the some of those fouls were kind of unnecessary. Like the the Reagan Beers one, I think, on the baseline, if I'm not mistaken, I'm like, oh, I don't know, that's a tough call. And so, you know, it's always tough calls in these games. But I, I sometimes the officiating, I think they, they, they anticipate – and we always say you're calling it before it even happens, and it, and it doesn't happen. So I kind of agree with what everybody was saying on Twitter at the time. Uh, it was some pretty tough calls with that. How about you, Coach Neighbors, Coach Crawford? Yeah, I'm with Wesley there. I mean, you know, uh, you always want to see the best players play as many minutes as they can. Uh, that one obviously caught a lot of, a lot of flack, but just with like – I mean, that's – that's two big bodies going at it in there. And, and, folks, I got news for you. Camilla Cardoso, they list her at six, seven. They ain't no way that's right. She's bigger than that, uh, way bigger. Uh, walk by her next time you see her. She is bigger than six, seven. So I thought it was two Titans going at it. You know, having played against Coach Rook um, in the Pac-12 days, you know their team. Jonas Chatterton, give a shout-out to Jonas on here, assistant coach who does a great job with their staff. And, uh, all their staff, but Jonas really with their defensive stuff that he's always done, I thought had a, about as good a game plan as you can against South Carolina. They uh, they come at you in waves. Ashlyn Watkins, another one of those kids that until you play against her, you might not appreciate her as well as you should. She's got the ability to change shots, got the ability to guard ball screens and uh, really make your life difficult. Uh, I just I thought South Carolina that night particularly – they're going to be tough to beat no matter who they played. But obviously, Oregon State uh, had a great run, and that uh, that was a fun matchup to see. I'm glad we got to see it. Hate somebody that had to lose in that one. I lean more towards that, too. Like, it was it was a great game to watch. Um, Beers was really impressive. Um, I like the matchup. I do agree. Just throughout the uh, – <clears throat> excuse me. Just throughout the tournament, uh, you know, thankfully – I don't think I can get fined, but let's just hope not. Um, I just – the refs, 
I think are just becoming too much a part of the game. And I just would like to see more game. Like, I think that we're looking for stars and we're looking for the rising stars. We're looking for the, the, the maybe the not so talked about go to players that are making impacts. And there's a lot of times, like kind of Wes alluded to, is that refs are making calls before like plays are actually happening. And I think that that's disappointing, not just in that game. I mean, I think we can maybe name about four or five um, in the past week where it's just been questionable. Um, but I, I just, I enjoy the matchup and I definitely hate that that someone had to lose. But, you know, I would say that that was one of the most exciting well, I think they were all exciting, but that was that was one that I definitely enjoyed. For the committee, what were some standouts for you all um, during those games? I remember our last spaces, we were talking about like which quadrant or like what region would have interesting Elite Eight and Sweet 16 matchups. And, you know, all of us knew Albany 2 would be the draw in terms of like fan eyes. But I was excited about Albany 1, Albany 1, because of the fact that the teams match up so differently like South Carolina versus Oregon State are two completely like Oregon State gets their job done in the half court South Carolina likes to get out in transition both teams have bigs but they do it in two completely different ways and I think that what we saw in that game was exactly that like every single time South Carolina would go on a run or get up by eight Scott Rurick had a play call and they knocked down the three ball or Scott Rurick had a um, play call and they got the ball to beers and she made a shot Um, So it was just a really nice, like, chess match to see um, between both teams. And I was happy that um, in spite of the officiating, it was still a competitive um, game. Because I think my issue with officiating is that you can't make one mistake and just leave it at one mistake. Because they're typically going to try to make it up for it in another way. And then that's going to add. And then they're going to try to make up for it again. And that's going to add. They're going to try to make it up for it again because it felt like a lot of times maybe they would blow a whistle on Oregon State and then they would then go back on the other end and call something that's not a foul a foul so it was like it just kept going back and forth and so we missed some great moments but in terms of play um South Carolina to me is just a team that in any other year you could say like this is what's going to cause them to potentially lose a, a big matchup But every single game this season, when it's gotten close, it has been a new player to do the job. And to see what Tessa did in that game immediately, um, especially late when she got in the game, was insane. Like, I think Yana mentioned it in the group chat that, like, Oregon State did not score once she got in late in the fourth quarter for the rest of the game. Like, that's a true freshman doing that. She came in the game, immediately got an and one shot was defending really well. Her and Ashlyn played really well together, and both of those players come off the bench on and off um, throughout the season. So I was really impressed um, with them. And just like the coaches said, Beers was a star. I'm excited to see her for two more years in college. Anyone else from the committee? Um, Yeah, I agree with everything uh, everyone has said so far, and I just want to highlight that, like, Put some respect on all these teams that made it to the Elite Eight. Um, Like, I know everyone expects uh, South Carolina to, like, blow people out. But these teams are good, y'all. Like, they're good. Indiana was a good team. Oregon State is a good team. Like, it's not always going to be a blowout. The games are going to get closer. They're going to get tougher as you go through each, um, you know, Elite Eight to the Final Four to the championship game. Because these teams are good, they're well coached, and they're hungry. Nobody wants to go home. Like it's the it's winter go home, and everyone's gonna put forth their best their best effort. So like, give these teams some credit for real. So to the coaches, when um a question that I have for you all, do I've always wondered, do you always reveal everything, or do, or are there like special trick plays or some sort of action that? you keep in your back pocket for those like, uh uh-oh, here we go type moments? Or do you just allow your teams like, hey, this is how we play, no trick shots, no trick this and the other, and it's like, you know what to do, the game plan is in, let's execute. Like, what do you do for those special scenarios? Uh, 
I was, what, I was just I was just gonna defer to head coach and then pending head coach before answering. All right, I'll go. Um, I like to have one play. What we do is we run one play the first of, of the year. Like we'll we'll work on one play until we run it. So like, you know, some years you don't ever have a sideline play to win it or an un- inbounds play under three to win it. But we work on one play all year long, and once we run that play and get it on film, then we change it because recruiter, you know, the scouters are too good, and they're going to know what you ran that one time. So uh, I would tell you that we always usually end the year with a uh, – I wouldn't call it necessarily a trick play, but, you know, an action that nobody's seen, uh, one that Wesley can't down, stand down there, and when I stand up and grab my belly, he knows that means fat screen because uh, I'm grabbing my, my, my gut, you know, and he's up there yelling, that means flat, you know, because Wesley scouts, and he knows. There's Debbie Antonelli walking in the room. Hi, Debbie. Um, so, like, I, I, we run one. Uh, we have one that we save, and once we run it, we put it in the hopper. How about you, Coach Brooks? Is there anything out here that, you know, we can look forward to? You've been, you've been already kind of getting your – your wheels turning with some special plays. Obviously not give away your special plays, but like how do you look at those moments and say, okay, this is what we can do? Or do you have a special scenario that would probably be your favorite type of play to run? Like if it's like like Coach said, you know, you're you got three seconds left or out of bounds type play or something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, obviously uh, I've learned from Kevin and one of the things that, you know, that kind of just prepared us he would always say, hey, we need to have fresh ideas, keep ideas rolling, keep ideas rolling. One thing we would do is we identify kind of a weakness. We find a weakness and then we kind of, you know, obviously, you know, attack that weakness and maybe even set up, set something up uh, to build on that weakness. So he would always say, keep fresh ideas going and we will have different scenario play. Obviously, we have a, a late game play if there was late game down two, late game down three. Uh, end of the quarter play, down two, in a quarter de- play, down three. In a quarter play, we want to get a certain player to the free throw line. So uh, situational uh, based on players and matchup, as well as situational based on uh, the time and score of the game. Coach Crawford? Uh, well, I don't have any – um, you know, I don't have any special plays. I, I kind of look to see, like, how are they guarding – um, like when I'm giving suggestions, I look to see like how are they guarding screens? How are they guarding our our go to players? Um, what's maybe something that they haven't guarded yet today? Um, and so that's I'm looking more from a scheme perspective of what's going on in the course of the game, so I can just make um, you know valuable suggestions as as um you know we're trying to every possession matters, so just trying to get a bucket on that possession, um, you know, especially in late games like that. Okay, appreciate that. And so the games that we just discussed, of course, those were the first night of the Elite Eight games. And moving on to sun, uh, moving on to last – oh, someone said something? Oh, wait, hold on, B. Can I ask a follow-up to your question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, for the coaches, so how – we've talked about execution in crunch time a lot this uh, March. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being all the time, how often would you say that you call the timeout, Joy, and then the players go out and execute it? Well, for us, when we were at Ohio State, I think that was one of our strengths. We would we would do a very good job. I mean, that's something that we emphasize uh, in shoot-around. Uh, we emphasize in different uh, situations in practice. So we 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 really uh, I, we kind of took pride in that. We knew that was one of the things that we were really good at. So I would say we did a good job of executing that. Um, and uh, Kevin loves to run offense, so uh, he he if if you if you couldn't get it, you you go come over there and sit by us. <laughs> and can we go and acknowledge the 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 Abby change in the middle of this space? It was like, hold on, let me go ahead and get this new picture up here. Y'all see that I'm this head coach now. So we we, we 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 like the picture. We feeling the picture. We got to come out to Utah and support you, okay? 
Yeah, I mean, everybody got, well, he said, you got to take the Ohio State stuff down. I said, well, dang, I just got the job yesterday. I mean, <laughs> look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you my last 24 hours. Like, I, obviously, you go through a process, and this is just, just so, you know, I know you guys like to know what's really going on, how the business really works. So I'll just tell you guys my process because it was kind of crazy. Uh, the day before we played Duke, uh, I got a call from this AD and like, hey, would you be interested? And I'm like, well, yeah, but we're about to play Duke. But, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely interested. So after that, I tell Kevin, I said, hey, Kevin, uh, they reached out to me. He said, I already know. I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> so he said, they told me they were going to call you. So, yeah, he said, I think that's a great opportunity for you. If you need any help, let me know. And then – they called me, and then Tuesday we do it. After we lost the Duke, they gave me a couple of days, because I was like, "What in the hell?" Excuse me, but what in the hell is going on? How do we? How do we blow it? And then uh, they they did a Zoom with me on Tuesday. Then they did it after they do the Zoom with me on Tuesday. They told me uh, the next day, "Hey, we want to fly you out Friday." I'm like, "Okay." And then after they say we want to fly you out Friday, they offered me the job Monday at three o'clock. Yesterday I was on a plane at six, and today they announced me. So in a week span. Uh, it, it was the wildest process I, I've ever been about part, but it's, I'm grateful and I'm thankful. And this, this kind of shows you, you know, this is one of the good side of this business, right? You get a job, but there's also a bad side where, you know, this time of year, there's coaches losing jobs and stuff. So it, it cuts both ways. You know, obviously uh, it cut this way right here. And I'm very blessed and I thank God for the opportunity. But also there's some good coaches out there that, you know, it, it cuts the other way too. But that's just kind of how wild this business is and how crazy it is. So we love being flued out. <laughs> <laughs> Shay, did you have a, um, any other follow ups? No, no. I just was hoping to get Coach Crawford's perspective too on timeout execution. Um, I would say, uh, I would say probably like a an eight and a half. But I would also say, like, I think it, it goes to um, coaches knowing what they can draw and knowing what their team can comprehend is why I think that number across the board is probably higher than, than you know, non-coaches would probably think. Just because, like, we know what well, we should know what our team can do. And so don't draw up anything on that board where they're like, they're going to get out there and be like, what did coach draw up? So you just try to draw up things that they know, um, things that they're familiar with and putting them in positions. And um, I would say like consistently like eight and a half, nine range. Okay. Appreciate that. And we have a few little technical difficulties. So we are trying to get coach neighbors back up here. Um, we, we know the Wi-Fi. Sorry, Mark. The Wi-Fi might not be the best in Cleveland. Um, no offense to any of my Ohioans. Or are they Ohio words? <laughs> Ohio wins. Yeah, I think that's it. So um, we're going to go to um, the games that we all witnessed last night. To the tune of 12.3 million average viewers, I think this was a game that everybody and their relatives were tuned into, LSU versus Iowa. Um, two top teams. Um, we, this was a rematch from the national championship game last year. Um, some notable occurrences in that particular game, um, LSU, they, they obviously already a shortened bench a little bit due to the injuries and ailments that they've experienced. Um, the Angel Reese ankle injury during the game, Caitlin mother flipping Clark, um, doing her big one in what? 41 points, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I think she, yeah. 40 ball. Um, and we've all seen the clips and we've all seen the memes, um, in regards to certain players attempting to guard her, the shrugs, all those good things. And Iowa's role players really stepping up for that game. What were some of your key takeaways and what were like some of your uh, damn type of moments? Um, I'll start. Speed. When I was on playback, I literally said before the game, because everybody, you know, said um, LSU had the advantage in the paint, which they did. But like I was telling everybody on playback, I was conditioned to run. That team will run all game if you let them. They love fast break points. They want to get out and run. Their post players be getting out and run. As soon as you shoot that ball, they are out and running. 
And LSU, on the other hand, they are better suited to play a half-court offense, especially with the limited bench minutes that they receive from people. So, I like I told everybody, if Iowa can get out and run, it could be an interesting game. And that's what Iowa did. I think LSU kind of played into Iowa's hand of trying to run with them. And in the end, Iowa was just a little bit more conditioned. I think something that's really underrated about Iowa is everyone says, like, Caitlin doesn't have help. But um, I think Andrea um, spoke about it. But a falter had, like, four points per game against ranked opponents this season. She put up, like, 21 last night. Um, Gabby Marshall, one of the smallest people on the floor, had 18. Um, but not just those two. Hannah Stokey is a starting big for them. But when Hannah goes out, to me, they get better on defense because their backup bigs are more traditionally sized and do a better job of defending bigger post players, which is typically what you're trying to do against um, Iowa is you let your big go against their smaller bigs. But when they bring in O'Grady, her, like she can match up with just about anybody over six foot four. She, I think she's six foot five. She plays really well. Um, and because of that, it makes it really hard to Yana's point if you cannot score and execute. Like watching Iowa play gives me anxiety because if you are rooting for the other team and that other team cannot make shots, they are cooked. Like is is cooked because if like Caitlin can miss seven consecutive shots, but when she sees one go in, she's gonna make seven consecutive shots. And that momentum is so hard to snatch back from them, especially when there are others like their other players are executing and playing well. And LSU ran up against a team where not just Caitlin was playing well, the others were playing well. So, like, everyone keeps saying, like, HBO got cooked, HBO got cooked, HBO got cooked, but just about everybody on the team got cooked because everybody on Iowa was getting <laughs> off. Like, it wasn't just Caitlin. Like, typically, like, go to the South Carolina game last year in the Final Four. South Carolina did a pretty good job of being, like, it's just Caitlin. It's just Caitlin. Caitlin won. The, I can live with that. But I can't live with the whole team getting cooked. Like, and that's what happened last night was the whole team got cooked. I never felt like after the third quarter that LSU would win the game. Never. Like, not even a little bit. For me, the most interesting part of the game was the first quarter. And um, trying to keep, like, try, sorry. LSU trying to keep up with Iowa's pace. I don't think I've seen LSU play that fast consistently this entire season. And so it's interesting that the score, what was it, 31 to 34 or something? 31-26, LSU 26, yes, okay. Yeah. Um, and that they scored 31 points in the first in the first quarter. I mean, like, that really goes to the pace of which Iowa was trying to play. And LSU doesn't have a deep bench. So I think that was always going to be a pretty difficult matchup. Obviously, with Caitlin Clark being Caitlin Clark and being as um, pole, not necessarily polarizing, but just uh, as magnetic. That's the word I'm looking for. As magnetic um, as she is and garners so much attention. Now, not only do you have to guard her, as you as you mentioned, D, like now everyone else is playing at, at a pretty high rate. Um, I'm a big Gabby Marshall fan. Um, and so I think that just the fact that they were conditioned to play for 40 minutes was always going to be tough for LSU because they were trying to play at that pace, especially early on, instead of trying to play their game and, and slow it down when they can, and especially the transition defense um, and working on that. Yeah. And I, and I would say, uh, I think you you hit the nail on the head because I think uh, what people don't realize what Iowa is when Caitlin is pushing that ball and she's setting the tempo like she did last night against LSU. It, LSU is so hard to play against. I mean, I just think about the first time uh, this season when we played them and we beat them. She wasn't. She she didn't push the tempo. She wasn't. Uh, she was scoring, but she wasn't getting the others involved. And and when she's getting everybody else involved, is when they're the most dangerous. And when she's pushing it, the tempo and pushing it. Uh, pushing that this with the long outlet pass, that's when you know you were in trouble. Like the first time we played them uh, this season at Ohio State, uh, she went for 45, but she really wasn't looking to get everybody involved. 
uh, really wasn't looking to really pass. But the second time, I knew we were in trouble that day when she she hit a couple long passes to Stalky down the middle. And it's like, oh, boy, all right, she's in a passing mood today. And when she starts to do that, uh, it, it really can cause problems. And uh, and when and when they're and when the others are hitting, you know, and so like you said, with a falter and they start getting going, uh, it and, and Gabby Marshall, and we all know what Kate Martin's gonna do. They're really really hard to play against in that pace. Uh, they push it like they don't want to really defend, but they use that pace because they they figure you're not gonna outscore them either. So that's that's kind of the trick with Iowa. So if you can if you can match scoring with them. That's going to be the key. And that's kind of the, I, I think I haven't told you this, but I think we've had these conversations. I think that's what makes this South Carolina team so unique is that in years past, they couldn't score like this. And the other thing that makes South Carolina so unique this year is that they always have an answer. Like now, and, and they always have an answer for what anybody does. Like people will push them and whatnot. And I know you got a little frustrated with the Indiana game, but they responded and they had an answer. And so, to me, you know, and I have to get ready to go. I, if South Carolina is able to pull this thing off and finish it, I, I to me, I'm, they're going to be one of my top all-time teams because of the way I've seen them respond and the way I've seen a lot of good teams this year push them. Um, but I got to run, guys. It's been it's been great uh, joining you guys. I love to join uh, another time. I got to actually take a recruiting call. I need some players. So you guys got some players for me. Hey. I'll take them, but hey, this has been great, and th- I just—I I told you I'd do it, and I, I just wanted to hop in and do it, guys. So, uh, thank you, coach. Appreciate yep, you. And, and if y'all at the Final Four, I'll be there Thursday. Anybody, feel free to come up. Uh, love to say hello. Go Aggies. Go Aggies. I love it. I right, talk <laughs> to you guys soon. Appreciate you. Appreciate Pour the popping. Pour the popping. <laughs> Uh oh, Coach Crawford, you in the hood now, baby? You by yourself? Uh, you <laughs> see. What's up? And we see some of our other fans, our, uh, our other uh, friends of the committee down there. Definitely, y'all. <clears throat> I'm not calling any particular names, but College Station, <clears throat> uh, Norfolk State, if y'all down there, y'all want to go ahead and come up, um, definitely raise your hand. Or I'm going to just start sending some invites um, for you all to come and speak. Um, we, we we love your teams. We we always appreciate what you all do. So the more the merrier, any coaches who want to come in and give their insight. So, um, for that game, staying on the LSU and Iowa game before we uh, move on to the next game, how did y'all feel about the officiating? I think my sentiments are the same as as I mentioned well, earlier. I, I, yeah, I'll just leave it at that because I still am not sure I think, if I can get fined or not. So I'm just still gonna leave it there. I think it's 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 impossible right now in this climate to officiate right now and I'm not giving them a pass I'm just saying that every single player left in the tournament had or every single team has a style of play and if the refs are like whatever mood the refs are in factors into how the game will look is is my take on it like the the way Angel fouled out last night BS um like we can look at just about every single game to what coach Crawford said earlier and pinpoint where officiating impacted the game. What I will say is, is that the LSU Iowa game was one of the games where I was, I didn't stare at the officiating. Like if, I mean, I just thought Iowa had a better game, you know, but it wasn't major and I've seen worse in this tournament for me. Yeah, I agree. I don't think the officials made themselves a big part of the game. I think the biggest was the lack of adjustments on LSU's part. I don't yeah, I at some point you gotta send the house to catch blitz, something else, tackle. I don't know, but we, we gotta try something else. <laughs> I was re- I I was really excited about the way that the WNBA players responded to that game. Like the entire Las Vegas guard core group was like, absolutely not. Like Kelsey, who we know used to not to defend, no shade to coach neighbors, um, who we know didn't defend was on Twitter talking about well, they in drop. <laughs> um, uh, 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 Clark was on here like this, a mess. Brittany Sykes is like, well, get her to the league. Cause she's going to have to go right. 
Um, so it was really cool to see WNBA players being inspired by the challenge of guarding Caitlin. Because for me, I think part of the reason Caitlin's so good in college is because physicality is not allowed in a sense. Like, you can't really body her up and put that wear and tear on her like WNBA players can and are allowed to do. So she really can just be out there jogging, you know, and LSU didn't really make it their mission to make her defend either. So it's like, if you going to put HVL on me, baby, all I got to do is worry about one side of the ball. You know, if I want to play defense, I can, but you know, I don't really have to. Um, So yeah, it, yeah. Yeah, that was just tough. Yeah, I'm not going to drag it, but you can see Caitlin's not even looking at HVL when she's dribbling. She's already looking at the play behind her because she's like, I can go by her anytime. When somebody is doing that, you got to switch up the scheme at some point. And I also feel like with Caitlin, Caitlin's a big guard. Like, she's not tiny at all. She's, I think, I don't know how tall she is, but Caitlin's pretty tall for a point guard. Six. And Haley Van Lith is not. And so Haley was already playing with her hands down defensively. Caitlin ain't like I, for a score like that, your hands are already down. You're like three inches shorter than me. I can see the basket clearly. I like you're you're basically non-existent at this point. And I definitely think Flage would have been the better matchup because Flage is longer. She's more like she's quicker. And she probably would have been in Caitlin's face a little bit more. I would like to say something about that. Um, I think the tough part is Flage needs to score. And so chasing around Caitlin Clark for 40 minutes. And I'm not, again, I'm not Kim Mulkey. I have not won a national championship. And so I'm not trying to say what one should have done. I don't know. I don't know their team. I'm not coaching their team. But I, I just from watching them this whole tournament, um, uh, HBL has been on every go-to player, and they've been going under every single ball screen the all all tournament. So I'm not, again, just putting facts out there, and maybe not every single time. But the games that I've watched, I've seen HBL consistently on the other team's best player, um, and I've seen her go under under those ball screens, and I, it hasn't impacted her again I don't I can't talk about the decision making um for that and I'm not criticizing the decision making for that um but I do think that uh Flage um has to be a scorer and I think it's just really difficult um when you need one of your best defenders to also be one of your best scorers and I think that just makes it just a little difficult of a matchup and we know how difficult it is to match up with Iowa in general, just because of, uh, you know, the nature of their team. And I I just, I think that both teams gave it their all. And again, I like to stay neutral. I'm not criticizing, just put that on the record. I'm not criticizing anyone's coaching decisions um, because I'm not there. You know, I'm sitting at home watching them on the couch. So I don't know any better. (laughs) Eating Chipotle. I guess my um, follow-up, and I love that you clarify because you know the girls like to get crazy. Um, I will say, like, just for, I guess, any of the coaches in the room, um, how then do you go about guarding Caitlin in this setting then if set specifically for the teams remaining? <laughs> like, <laughs> talk to Jesus so, it. like, we go, because we, you know, we have to preview the Final Four. I'm jumping ahead, but... You know, UConn has a short bench, same as LSU. Um, Their best defender, differently than LSU, isn't a score. So I guess that's a good thing. But then what happens if that player gets in foul trouble? Um, Like, how do you, like, do you just say, let Caitlin get off and then try to stop everybody else? Like, what is that? I think the way that Caitlin's been playing, especially in this tournament, by getting everyone involved, it's too hard to just say, hey, let Caitlin get hers um, because she's willing to share the ball and she's looking for her teammates. Um, she's not forcing um, opportunities. You know, she took some some heat check shots, if you will, um, which I rightfully so. Right. Like she has range. So those are shots that she should um, take when she's feeling it. 
But, you know, I, I think you have to throw as many different defensive schemes as your team is able to maintain. Um, I was talking to, I'm not sure who I was talking to yesterday about it, but I think the hard thing about guarding Caitlin Clark is she's coming down the floor with the ball. And when you're playing, um, and when you have a point guard like her that has the ability to shoot really good vision, height, as we talked about, um, and she doesn't really get rid of the ball, it's really hard to to make a lot of, at least I don't know them, um, a lot of defensive adjustments or a lot of defensive schemes But besides just switching the matchup and then, you know, trying to keep it, keep her from getting it back. When she does get rid of it, um, that I feel like that's about all you can do. And just if you are a team that goes make misses, that's also something um, just to get them out of rhythm. So just doing anything you can with, with what within your scheme um, to mess up Iowa's rhythm. The first thing I would suggest is to figure out how to sprint back on defense. <laughs> not, not run, run for it. Yeah, run just for run. <laughs> your best. run, run, because they're going to run. So just outrun them, do your best. <laughs> you get there first, okay? So right. that wraps up game three. And game four, depending on how you want to call it, the, the now versus the future, the 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 all that good stuff. Che, introduce this game, please. <laughs> Juju and the nerds <laughs> versus Paige and the All Americans, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but um I'm I'm so proud of my Trojans. Like I was saying it yesterday, man. Ju is a superstar. She knows that. We know that. But to see her carry it like that. With this team, nobody had this team a p- couple possessions from the Final Four on paper to start the year. It is what it is. And to get here, I'm just proud of them. And, I mean, it's just a difference. In, like, the nerds didn't shoot well last night, and even if they hit their averages, we're headed to Cleveland. So it is what it is. But shout out to Gino. He did his big one this year. He he coached this year. Like, he did his thing. So I can't be mad at that. And Paige laid the hammer down when they needed it. But I'm proud of my Trojans. So what what were some of your I, I know you said the the nerds um and for anyone who's who's confused on what we mean we were talking about those players that transferred in from the Ivy League institutions um but what I guess was there at any moment Shay when you were like wait a minute we might we might pull this out like how, how are you feeling because we if you don't know Shay is our resident um I can't believe I'm about to say these three letters in in regards to them USC in the group so how are you feeling while watching that game uh I was actually that was the least nervous I was watching the game but the point where I was like oh we might do this is when Forbes tied it up 59-59 that shot was was crazy yeah that shot was ooh yeah cause she be scaring the hell out of me y'all but when she tied it up I was like oh we might do it and then Rhea (laughs) (laughs) but you know it's just you get to this point, and it's a miss make. It's miss a make at this point, and we couldn't make what we needed to. But I'm proud of them, Coach Crawford. What were um any I guess of your favorite moments um from that particular game? Let me just replay part of it in my head. Can I, can we get a circle back to me as I? <laughs> yeah, we know it was an exciting. It was an exciting. It was game. An, there were a lot of good moments, and you know, I still also have to work. So there's times where I'm, you know, locked in on on other things. And so let me just think about the game, and just let's get another little round robin and come back to me. <laughs> I got you. I got you. <laughs> we know recruiting never stops. Game plans, all that good stuff never stops. So yes. Yeah, so, um, what about you, Dolores? Like what? Like, we, we know, we, we watched the game together. We saw all the live interactions on the timeline. And as everyone has pretty much echoed, like, Juju, not Juju, Gino did his thing this year with, what, sometimes six players, seven players, and who thought that he would take a team with just seven bodies to the Final Four. But um, he's done that. So, like, what was the part that stood out to you? I I can't, like... I started the game and I was like, Juju's the best player on the four. And then halfway through, 
I was like, hold my damn beer. Paige Becker said, I'm about to remind y'all who I was in 2020 and kept her foot on her neck. Um, I was mostly, I was really impressed when when Gina went to the two big lineup, um, how they looked with that lineup. I thought for Ice to be a player that has, has not been consistent for them this year, um, definitely seemed to have struggled with confidence. She played some huge, I mean, huge minutes for them. She made, I think she made the three right before Forbes made the three that ended up getting them um, into the tie. But she, like, she looked ready for the moment. And for some years, I feel like I haven't seen UConn freshmen look ready for the moment. Um, and I was really impressed um, with her. We know Shade starts, um, but, you know, her and KK were in foul trouble um, so I was just really excited to see what Ice looked like. I know um, she came off an of injury last year. That was really exciting. Um, but also, like, for USC to have not been in that position before, it looks like they can go back any year moving forward, regardless of who the roster is. Like, Juju is better than the hype. Like, I really don't even know how to describe how good she is. Like, she is that good and then add some extra to it watching her like the game to me like I it was spastic at first like it, it both teams looked high off adrenaline um no one could control the ball everybody was hitting the floor shots were not falling but the way that Juju and um Paige like steadied the game and once they started trading buckets it I felt like I was watching a future national championship game um, so I was just really impressed by both teams, but my hat goes off to Paige for really like riding the ship. I know I've been hard on her this year because I do feel like in today's climate, we credit her for what we know she can be, not always what she does. And in this game, I felt like when two stars were at their best, she was a star, like a star star. So I was really impressed. Um by Paige leading that UConn team in this setting. And also, Aaliyah Edwards finally started finishing shots. Like, she she was not missing. Um, so, just a great game. It was probably my favorite game um, of the entire Elite Eight. It was really, really good. Yeah, so, to Dolores' point, uh, defensively, too, it was interesting to watch Caitlin be able to kind of just free roam, whereas Gino was like, we are sending two, sometimes three to Juju. And somebody else is going to have to beat us. And it's not a complicated game plan, but it worked. Yep. <laughs> yep. And to me, that speaks to how good Juju is. Like, <laughs> that. Like he was like, oh, somebody else is going to have to do it. And Juju still got it done. But he knew just how good Juju as a true freshman. And let's all, like, remember, four years ago, Caitlin and Paige went up against each other, if I'm not mistaken, in the Sweet 16. Um, and and UConn, I mean, murdered Iowa. And now it's almost like Juju has stepped right into that place at a later round and, in my opinion, had a better showing. So that was that was just really, really impressive um, seeing what they do, um, what they did. And to Shay's point, if... If USC could have gotten some three balls to fall, like maybe just three more than they got, like in at any point, I think they caught, they could have won the game. Okay, well, Coach Carter. I mean, Coach Crawford. Sorry. I also think that it's some of. <laughs> um, I was so I was gonna add that was one of my points. Um, I got my my thoughts together. Um, but just USC shot 31% from three. And I think there were just points in the game um, where UConn's synergy to overpowered um, USC in some of those moments because this core group has been playing together for a while besides, um, you know, besides Samuels, but like they've, they played together and, and the freshmen. So I guess it's a, it's a little different, but, you know, they're led by Paige. And so they know that they are, are supposed to, you know, um, follow Paige's lead. And I think that just their experience, especially in those big moments, um, 
and Gino leading them in those big moment moments, um, I I think that kind of overpowered, um, you know, those moments in for uh, USC. But I, when I tell you every time I'm watching Juju, who I'm like, okay, because Juju is a bucket, all right. Like I wouldn't want to guard Juju. There's a lot of people that I've guarded in my time, and. You know, mm, go ahead, tell us. Who, who, no, who you, no, who no, no. I'm not, I'm going, I'm not getting into that. I'm I not getting into it. Because the people need to know. <laughs> I'm not getting I, I, I've guarded the best of the best. She in the played Big in the East. old Big E. She don't want to talk about it. Yeah. The real yeah, Big E. I've guarded, I've guarded the best of the best in the Big E. So if you look up at my time there and you look at who is the best in the league, just know that I probably guarded them. So let's just, we'll say that. And won. And won against them. We won, right, some, we won sometimes. Okay, we didn't win all the time, but we Come won on, sometimes. <laughs> we we won enough. Um, but I I really admire Juju's game. Like I'm so excited. Um, I, I'm just really excited about all of the just how women's basketball has grown. Not to get on uh, a pedestal, but it's just really exciting. I, I graduated 12 years ago, and there's no way that I would have thought that the game um, that I love so much and that I share that love with other people, how much. Um, fandom would come you know just 12 years later and as we've been saying just invest in women's sports it's not a risk and um we we're seeing that we're seeing that with um 12.3 million viewers that is the highest number of views over like nfl games nba games like all of these uh, premier um sports where they're making money um and it's just really exciting to see, but I'm excited to see the future of women's basketball. It's in good hands with Hannah Hildago, um, Juju Watkins, um, you know, um, Madison Booker, Malaysia. I mean, like we could go on and on and on. Like Caden Samuel showed up in a big way. Okay, she's from the DMV. Shout out to the DMV. Uh, but yeah. yeah. Um, but it's just it's just really exciting. So not to get too sentimental, I'm just really excited to see where the game goes over the next couple of years. And then, you know, even this weekend, I think there's gonna be more records, um, bigger records set, you know, twelve point three might be fifteen, right? So So I'm gonna do uh, appreciate that, um, Adria. I'm gonna do another introduction of um uh, <clears throat> Of my little shouty from the Maryland area, from the DMV, all that good stuff. Earn, earn, earn. We have. Uh, oh my God. Oh my God. God. Brandon, <laughs> oh my God. And for some of you all who have been tapped in, we're going to have coaches in and out because we know a lot of them are preparing to be in Cleveland. As Coach Neighbor said, he's already there with his drink. Allegedly, we'll see. But um, we do thank you all for taking the time. But we have assistant coach Kania Cole, who is with us, who played for the legendary David Six at Hampton University. She knows a thing or two or three about going to the NCAA tournament. So, and she's currently an assistant coach at William and Mary. Um, so, Coach Kania Cole, thank you for joining us today. We're just gonna pick your brain, you and Coach Crawford, and any other coaches that decide to pop in throughout. Um, this particular episode and just talk about some of the games and some of the things that you're excited to see um, going into this weekend. So how are you? I am doing good. I'm sneaking on here to chit chat with y'all. I just put my baby to bed. So I'm here. Lord, mother probably warming up. My them, baby um, crew. Milk. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, like you said, I'll be in and out, but I was amazed about the games last night. I mean, it was just a joy to see all the coverage that the girls are getting now. Um, like people that I follow, I follow people who don't know a thing about basketball. I mean, girls who do hair, they talk about injuries, they talk about juju. And I'm just following people that, you know, are just your everyday Twitter users. And they were watching the game last night. So to speak to Adria's point, I'm so glad the game has grown the way it has. Um, just from just the coverage in general, I mean, you said, you know, that I played at Hampton. We didn't nearly get this much coverage um, as some of the girls that play at HBCUs get. But it's just a testament to how much the game has grown. And I can only imagine what it would have been like, what, how many years did I graduate? Oh, like eight or nine years ago. Um what it would have been for us, but I'm glad that the game has grown so that the, these kids now can get this exposure. 
Um, I guess the game that's kind of been on the forefront of my mind is the UConn USC game. Cause let me tell you, Juju is that girl. Okay. Um, usually she plays too late for most people to stay up and watch her. I eat me um, when my baby goes to sleep, I go to sleep. Um, but when I watched her last night, I was like, guys, the game is in great hands. I mean, she and Paige put on a show. I thought it was a masterclass in scoring. Um, I thought they got a lot of similar shots, but the way that they got their shots were totally different on different ends of the floor. Um, I mean, you, what you saw from Juju was, you know, majority isolation and just getting to her spots at whatever pace and speed that she wanted to, um, with just so much poise and smoothness to her game. I mean, she's only going to get better and I just can't wait to see how USC develops, you know, their offensive systems to get her more shots and without her having to take as much, uh, breaks and stuff for offense the way she does. Um, but for UConn, I know Paige is going to Paige and everything, but for them to be where they are with seven players, I mean, I, no matter how you put it, that's incredible on their part. I can't imagine the mindset and, you know, where those kids were mentally when all those other kids went down and, and, you know, got hurt. But the kid that stuck out to me last game was Ice Brady. I mean, she came in, they made the adjustment, went big, and her and Aaliyah Edwards went to work. And I know, you know, her leash hasn't been, you know, as long as it was last night, but when the lights came on, she was ready. And I also got to give a shout out to uh, to Kaden Samuel, PG County. You know, you know how we do. She came, uh, in, uh, hit a, yeah. you know, she came in and hit a couple shots. I don't even think she yeah. played the last game. I don't think, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think she played. But she came in and did exactly what she was supposed to do. Shot the shots when she was wide open and was out there trying to play D. Like, it was a couple of possessions where UConn was really trying to lock up. And like y'all had spoke to earlier, they were sending two and three at Juju because they knew, like, hey, when she gets that rebound and gets out, it's going to the basket. So we got to make sure that she's guarded at all times on the floor. But ultimately, it was a really good game. I thought to start. You know, the hype of the first game kind of was like, oh, gosh, what are we watching? You know, but as the game progressed and they kind of shook off some of the jitters, I thought it was very, very good to watch. And like I said, the game is in good hands. I'm a Juju stand. I just need to know where she get her edge control from. I will buy it right now. Okay. Get girl, Juju an edge control deal right now. For real. Like, she be sweating and them edges do not be missing. So Let me call Jade tonight. That's all, that's all you had to say. I'll call Jade tonight. Please, eco, eco style. Let me get. Let me get. Eco I don't even think that because I be using that and it don't work. <laughs> yeah, like I don't know. I don't. Because listen, whatever she has, I need it too. Because I don't know how you like. I just how how teach whatever uh, silk scarf she used to wrap exactly. the bun up. I don't know. I need too. it. <laughs> I think Shay has a question for you all. Any coaches in the room? Oh no. Oh, go ahead, B. No, Sorry. Say, any other coaches in the room, definitely feel free to raise your hand. We see a lot of you all in here waving. So go ahead and come on up. Um, what, what were you about to say, Shay? Earn, earn, earn. Uh, don't. I just got to brag on. We got multiple DMV folks on the stage. So I got to. Kania is, I think, a four-time MEAC champ. Correct me if I'm wrong, sister. Four-time? I am. Okay. Yeah. And thank you. That's also, ran the table at Paint Branch in high school. Correct me if I'm I wrong. Did. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Coach Crawford, I'm going to brag on you. We've never met, but you, I think you might have been coached by my uncle, Artie. Um, I do, I love, she is I in the Fairfax Art. Stars Hall of Fame. I, I, if, I, if I remember that correctly, you're in the Fairfax Stars Hall of That's Fame, correct. right? Okay, I just gotta brag on who all up on the stage. I'm sorry, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta brag on who up here. We'll be saying the DMV. Go ahead, Mo. She <laughs> said the DMV is the capital of who? Yeah, That's Mo. What I'm hearing. Yeah, Mo. I'm just making sure, order. and we kill Mo. While we showing Cadence love, <laughs> Cadence, that's McNamara, that's my alma mater. I'm just saying, I gotta let them know what's going on, what type of time we on. Yeah. We appreciate it. The, so, <laughs> go ahead, Dobie. No, it's the. I look. I had to study Juju's bun at the top, y'all. That that it it is flat. Like it's it looks like they they slap that thing between um the pop the toaster and line that thing up. It it does not move. It ain't a circular. It is a straight. It's it's a line. <laughs> the bunt is flat. So that means she wraps it with a very good silk either like <laughs> scarf something. But you're not messing that bun up. You don't see her messing with her hair mid-game. It, that thing be flat. Like it's toasted. 
Ain't no bobby pins in there. <laughs> but um, I want so speaking of the tournament, then um, since the both of you have played in the NCAA tournament, and before we get into the final four and like how you were game plan, so I'm gonna let y'all marinate on that a little bit. Talk about like the experience as a whole. We know that things have changed. Um, we've all seen the progress that women's basketball has made. Um, we've seen the investment from the NCAA in regards to you know the March Madness monikers and all those good things. But what was it like? And I know Kania. Um, excuse me, Coach Cole, <clears throat> you've talked about, you know, sometimes you, you know, walking up against your opponents and, you know, you're going into the tournament and then boom, it's the Aguma case sisters or anything like that. But what were your, <laughs> what were your fun experiences during the NCAA tournament? I mean, well, would you, what you saying that the NCAA has grown, they would never, ever fly a one seat to go and play a 16 the way they did Stanford. Okay, Stanford had to fly from California. Wait, Stanford to came to you, to you all? They came to ODU and played us at ODU. That will never, ever happen again. <laughs> like, never. Um, but I think my, my, I think it was sophomore year. We played Duke at Duke. And I think, was Chelsea Gray on the team? I think she was. Yeah, that was should have been the, Chelsea and Elizabeth, maybe. Yeah, that game was fun. I think we lost by like fourteen, but it was fun. Like we could have lost by thirty, and we didn't. Um, but it was fun, and I think it was fun because it's fun to play in camera indoor, right? Like you're in. We in Duke men's locker room. Like, oh my god, like this is the this is the Duke starting five. This is where they, you know, like, this is where they sit or whatever. But I think playing Duke at Duke was cool. I mean, yeah, Duke at Duke was cool. Um, I had to guard Ariel Powers, a couple of possessions my junior year. Insane. Um, but it was fun. I think all the years was fun, just being treated like royalty for the time that you're there. Um, I think the selection uh, process is, is also cool, you know, getting your name called and seeing your reaction and stuff on the news. I think probably the worst one was when we played Stanford because they just smacked us on the screen. It was the very first thing up there. And it's like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Like, oh, we got to go down the street. Cool. No big deal. But outside of that, it was a really fun experience just seeing all your hard work pay off. And I have like a running joke with my teammates. I tell them all the time, if we got to play a game, we probably would have won by 30. So. Y'all would have. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, okay. What about you, Coach Crawford? Mm, okay, so you know how everybody like, all, like you got training table, you got snacks, you got all these things that kids have in their locker room now. Like they can get food at any point. They got personal chefs. They got all of that, right? When I played, even though it was only 12 years ago, we didn't have any of that. So I would say outside of just competing, because I, I love basketball, I love playing, I love winning. But the best part was like that we had snacks in our locker room. So I would say just like we go from shoot around, we got oranges, we got cheeses, we got everything in the locker room um, that we didn't ever like. We never had like we never experienced. So kind of like what uh, Kenia was saying, or um, was that just the the red carpet that was rolled out? Um, I would say one of my my favorite games to play, but one of my worst memories was just playing UConn um, in the Sweet 16 game to go to the Elite Eight. Um, we ended up losing by five. I stand on it. I stand on it with my teammates that if we would have won that game, we would have won a national championship um, because they were, the, they were the toughest team to beat. And um, like we, we, we definitely believe that. So I would say like in terms of competition, that was my favorite game to play. Um, even though it ended, it resulted in a loss. Um, and then off the court, just obviously your memories with your teammates, but then really the snacks, the oranges. The oranges were hitting. The oranges were hitting. I don't know what kind of oranges they had back then, but. In hindsight, I fumbled the bag. I didn't take any of my signage. I'm so blown. <laughs> oh, yeah. You got to take your signage. I took, like, my name, my press thing, like, with your name on it if you go to the podium. But, like, everything else, I just left it. I didn't know. <laughs> I love that. Uh, mm, not your, So what year was that? That was 2012, right? So it probably wouldn't have been no four P. If you had five points, Adria, y'all couldn't get five more points. Don't. Please. Please. <laughs> please. Wait, was that, was, was Monica still it was there? 2011, with that? yes. Yes, Monty was still there. 
Sugar Rogers. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, I I just said that's my worst memory. You don't have to get into it. <laughs> My bad, my bad. We was just trying. I mean, to yes, I, life is five points. I know what five, I know how to count to five. I know how many points five. Is. What? What? I know how many what's our good? Is. What's our good lady that always be letting us know how educated she is on the broadcast? It's a two possession game. It's a two possession game. Yeah, exactly. I know it's it's correct. I know, I know we only needed to score a couple more. Just just two, three more buckets. I think we would have been okay. But so I can't. Okay, I'm, I'm, my bad, my bad. I appreciate that. But um, so we're going to we're going to move forward to the final four preview. Um, we want the, the coaches and and Kani, We know you got to go. You know, get the baby soon. So um, just I guess talk about what you perceive or or um, what we've seen. We've all watched the games over the season, the strengths, and I don't want to use the word weaknesses. I'll say the opportunities for growth. So for those of you out there, know some SWOT analysis. Well, I guess. The W doesn't mean weakness. So anyway, um, we're going to talk about each of these teams: uh, South Carolina, North Carolina State, Iowa, and LSU. So the first matchup um, of the day will be South Carolina, North Carolina State, and then Iowa. Excuse me, Iowa and UConn. Um, for the South Carolina and North Carolina State game, what are some of the areas you think will be really key um, for both of the teams in order to um, come out with a dub? Um, I think that South Carolina has to do what they've always always done all year. They have to own the rebounding battle. I think if they don't have any interest in rebounding, I think that gives NC State a chance. And like on the flip side, I think NC State's ability to make shots and go on runs has been successful for them. I mean, Isaiah, Isaiah and uh, what's my girl, Sonia Rivers, their ability to get into the paint is impeccable they got to be able to play inside and out if they want to have a chance um are we just talking about that first game or we talk about the second game too oh you go ahead and do both um i think defensively uconn will have to have the same approach that they have for juju for caitlin um and i think that uh iowa's game plan that they have for lsu which is playing in transition um and hitting UConn where it hurts with attacking the basket because, I mean, they have limited bodies, um, will give them a, a good shot to make it to, you know, the big end. How about you, Coach Crawford? I think the biggest thing about the, the um, South Carolina NC State game is going to be pace and who controls the tempo of the game. Um, you know, I think these teams both had the ability to get up and down the floor. And so um, just – I. You know, as we just talked about, it's a possession game. Um, and this it may seem obvious. It's, it's going to come down to who has more possessions. Not necessarily, like, who's, obviously, who scores the most on those possessions. That's how the game is played. But I just think wh- who does the most and capitalizes off their possessions. So limiting turnovers, as Kenia talked about, um, the team that gets the most offensive rebounds and just creating more possessions um is is going to be the the team that's that's successful and the way that they do that um is offensive rebounding and it's going to be a huge key um uh, for NC State to match um South Carolina's size um and to to match their physicality sorry to match sorry for NC State to match South Carolina's I don't know if it's South Carolina State or not but South Carolina's um, That's fine. Size. Go ahead and speak it into existence. My, my <laughs> Bulldogs will be in the final four next year. Y'all heard it. My You're bad. Here, if, I, if, if I misspoke, um, just just the physicality is going to be um, what's going to be big for NC State, and I'm I'm just excited. I think they have different styles of play, um, and so I'm just interested to see how that um, how they match up, and then. Um, I mean, I'm just, obviously it's the, the page and, um, Caitlin show. I, I think we talked about just UConn, UConn's depth against Iowa might be difficult. I'm interested to see how Gino, um, you know, what Gino's matchup is. He's a really great coach for a reason. And so I'm sure that he is going to have his team ready. He's going to have a game plan ready. Um, and you know, both. Both um, powerhouses of of Paige and Caitlin 
uh, they're going to go get their shots. And, um, you know, I think that UConn, if they can be physical without fouling, is going to cause Iowa trouble. Um, I think when it comes down to being playing inside, though, you know, Aaliyah Edwards is going to have a lot of – have her work cut out for her with um, um, both of think. Iowa's – yes, both of Iowa's bigs, um, you know, whoever they put at the five, I think that's – she's going to have her work cut out for her. And so um, it's it's the team that stays out of foul trouble. You know, UConn has to stay out of foul trouble, um, which they, they, they do a pretty good job of – um, doing that because they've played shorthanded all year, and so they've they've learned to play without fouling. Um, but being to do that consistently and sprint back in transition, and just their level of conditioning is um, is going to be a big part in in Iowa. I mean, in Iowa, just they have to play defense. It's going to be tough to just sit and play UConn in zone. They're really good. They're efficient three point shooting team. They don't shoot a bunch of threes, um, but they they shoot them. They make them at a high rate. And so I think it's going to be tough, um, you know, to potentially hide their weaker defenders um, in zone. I'm also curious to see how Gino kind of manages the game. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't remember him calling too many timeouts against USC, right? Like he waited a little bit and then they had a couple to burn at the end. It's, I'm just curious to see how he's able to manage that with Iowa's, you know, pace and how they played last game. Do y'all, this is just a me question, two of them. One, um, in the NC State game, when River Baldwin was out of the game, they went with Mimi at the five and Hayes at the four. And I thought Hayes gave them some really big minutes against Aaliyah Moore, who is significantly um, bigger and taller than Hayes. But Hayes did a really good job of preventing her from scoring. She would get the rebound, but they just could not finish at the rim. So for for that game, South Carolina and NC State, how do you see the potential matchup of them? Because they don't really go deep into their bench either. um, And they don't have deep posts. So outside of River Baldwin, there she's going to be faced with maybe Hayes will be faced with guarding Ashton Watkins, Chloe, um, and Sanaya Fagan. And then for the other game, um, UConn shoots the three ball significantly better than um, LSU does. Um, and I've in some of the games that Iowa has struggled in, the things that have been common is Mackenzie Holmes was extremely dominant when Indiana beat them. Um, and I think Aaliyah Edwards definitely has the potential to do that um, against the Iowa Bigs, but also Indiana can stroke it from three. Um, and I think that's a huge difference from LSU. So how do you guys see those potential um, matchups within the game? I think River Baldwin has to manage her her fouls um I'm not quite sure how much Hayes and Mimi Collins can do you know Mimi at the five and Hayes at the four I'm not so sure how efficient that would be against South Carolina because they're just so much bigger I think River being at the five and Mimi being at the four and then Madison being you know at the three or wherever she usually plays I think that works to their advantage because River is a bigger body. Um, and what was your second question about Iowa? And- um, that UConn can shoot the three ball and they have a post player that can be extremely dominant. Um, and that was a weakness they had against Indiana in their loss earlier this season. Um, I don't think that they can go zone the way they did against LSU. I think that that's something that, that was specific to LSU. I think they'll try to maybe pressure UConn a little bit, a little bit more. You saw, you know, USC try to throw that in and that gave them a little bit of problems. Um, so my biggest thing with beating UConn, you got to make them turn the ball over. Um, you can't let them get set in their system. I mean, cause once they get grooving, we saw last night, they, they're pretty much on stop up when they get into their groove and the flow of their offense. All right, anybody from the committee, Any <clears throat> anything that you all are looking for from the games? Oh, Coach Crawford, you, did you want to answer that question? I'm sorry. 
Oh, it's okay. I have ADHD, so if you could ask the questions again. <laughs> um, just uh, in the South Carolina NC State matchup, the po- the possibility of Madison Hayes playing the four at times when River Baldwin is out of the game, and then in the UConn and Iowa matchup, um, the ability for UConn to knock down the three ball and Aaliyah Edwards being an All-American does that pose a different or more difficult challenge for Iowa um, in each of those matchups? Okay, I'm going to answer it backwards. Um, okay. So to your your second question, I kind of talked about that. Um, I think UConn is, is um, as I said, they're an efficient three-point shooting team. They don't jack a bunch of threes. They are probably not revered as, as a three-point shooting team, right? Like that's not something that, people are saying about them, um, but they're an efficient three-point shooting team. They're going to take open shots. They're, they have one thing about Gino, they, it is very rare that a UConn team takes bad shots. They, it's just very, very rare um, where universally it's like, that's a bad shot. Like that's not something that you say about UConn's teams. Um, and so I agree with Kania that I think it's going to be tough um, to play them in zone consistently uh and then um madison hayes coming in um when river ball wins out i think that's just going to be tough i think they're just going to have to be physical um i don't know if i've watched nc state as closely as i would have liked to um throughout this tournament i'm uh i like their team um i'm always impressed at the job that west does and i'm not sure that he gets enough credit because I think that every year he's not, you know, the team is not really highly touted or, or widely talked about. And he's always in the conversation at the end of the year. And so I just think that um, that's really impressive. And um, I, I think that you're going to have to, they're going to have to be physical. They're going to have to, when, when River Baldwin is out, they're going to have to to do some matchups and do some funky schemes defensively uh, to keep South Carolina off balance. Thank you. Okay. How about you all, the committee? Shay, Craig, Yana. Um, let's see. I'll start with the Iowa UConn matchup. For UConn, um, I'm looking to see if they can get uh Ashlyn Shade going. I think that she brings a different dynamic to their offense when she can hit down, um, hit well knock down threes, and they're going to need them in this game versus Iowa. She started the tournament like hot like she was phenomenal to start the tournament and she's slowed down since then I don't think she scored in the Duke game and she didn't really score too much in the Southern Cal game so I'm interested to see if they can get her going because I think she's going to be an X factor for them um just to take some attention off of Paige um and then I also um think like I'm I'm excited to see how Aaliyah Edwards approaches this matchup because I really think she can go to work down there um, versus Hannah Stolke just because of her experience. Um, And then as far as Iowa goes, just interested to see how they do, um, you know, like their pace of play, um, if they can continue to stick with that and kind of like keep UConn running. And if the others can continue to do what they've been doing um, so far in this tournament, because uh, I think when they have everyone clicking, they're a really tough team to defend for 40 minutes at the pace of play that they play with. Uh, for the first matchup, NC State and South Carolina, I'm interested to see like the little one-on-one matchups that'll happen throughout the game. Like I know um, when I think about the Indiana South Carolina game, Camilla was like hooping, and South Carolina guards kind of went away from her for a while. Um, and it was kind of like, get the ball into Camilla. So I'm interested to see if like, that's something they're cognizant of when they're playing, like, because I do think Camilla's going to have the upper hand in the matchup in the paint. And so how often do those guards continue to play through her, but still be themselves too, and knock down shots that we know they're capable of. And for NC state, um, I'm interested to see how they honestly attack Powell. I think, like, NC State guards are very great one-on-one guards. They will break you down. They're quick. They get to their spots. They're really good in the mid-range. 
and Powell, this tournament so far, has been struggling guarding quick guards, and all three of NC State's starting guards are quick guards. So I'm interested to see how Powell defends in this game and if Dawn kind of has a way of hiding her on defense or if she maybe takes her out and just go with her quicker defenders like Malaysia and Tessa. So I'm just interested to see the chess match as far as that goes. I'm here for the narratives, baby. <laughs> look, look. Paige and Caitlin fans been going back and forth all year. Now is the time, sisters. Put on your big girl pants. Let's hoop. That's what I'm here to see. And as far as, like Yana said, NC State, they going to run HB dive with them guards. Get the ball, go down the lane, see what you can do. So it's going to be interesting to see that versus South Carolina's dominance in the paint. Well, we're going to have a time. My God. <laughs> we about to have a time. I do. I will say uh, everyone in the comments has been saying that we haven't really discussed it, but fitness um, in the final four. Um, do we think that that will come into play like fatigue, especially with the teams with smaller benches? Do we think that that'll play a factor? You can be tired tomorrow. <laughs> Like, you could be tired tomorrow. <laughs> we got the game now. I think this is for, like, all the marbles. I mean, you know, most of the time when you're in games like this, your adrenaline is going, you know? Okay, last thought. Um, Yana always says this to us. In the matchups that Iowa struggles in, it's against teams that look like them, quote, quote, quote. Do we think that the UConn matchup is more interesting because if it comes down to officiating, it won't be so black and white? Well, you know, I do. Because I, I think that um, when you are of a certain skin tone, you're allowed to defend Caitlin with a little bit more physicality than those that are of a different skin tone and so i do and nika is like the perfect defender for that um because she's physical she's quick and she likes to get up in you and if the refs allow her to kind of move caitlin from off of her spots and get in her face it can make things a little bit tougher for her for um iowa to get into their offense as quickly as they do sometimes all I'm going to say, if D. Cantner is officiating this game, she do not play by the hand check. She checked me a couple times. She was like, no, get your hands off. And then I had to quick foul. So I don't know. If D is up there, I don't know. <laughs> not you scorned. We got to know. We got to scout the rest. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> no, she she don't play. Like, D is really good at her job. Like, But she do not play about that hand check. She will tell you one time. And if you do it again, she is going to blow that whistle. <laughs> Because of the magnitude, I really feel like, let me see, that game is, yeah, D, Roy, and. She I'm is, she is, really? I don't I don't know. I'm just assuming because I feel like they're going to be paying attention to that game more than they do with South Carolina and North Carolina State. So I feel like that's going to probably be D, Roy, and Eric Bruton, or D, and, oh, Lord, the lady with the short hair. Not the one who everybody saw get out the way of the scuffle. I don't, it ain't going to be her. <laughs> <laughs> But he might D not even be at the final four. They <laughs> might have some of the WNBA officials, though. A lot of them Eric, have been, oh God, have be been Eric, good. It could be Eric Bruton and Roy. Oh, Lord Jesus. Okay. So I, I have a question. So we're going to get into this next part. Y'all know I like to play me a good little sound effect right here. So a little something fun. <clears throat> <laughs> But I was expecting some a little more than not that. No, no that's, I'll, let me see what else I got. There we go. So we're going <laughs> to talk about the portal. And while talking about the transfer portal, obviously since you all's day, um, one, two, ten years ago, um, things have changed a little bit. And so we know, understand that now, Obviously, there's a lot more freedom of movement in favor of the student-athlete. So when you're navigating this particular ecosystem or the climate that we're in right now, 
what are things that you look for or when you're looking into the portal like what's kind of your thought process of how you navigate those things um we've heard the stories that sometimes because of such fluidity within the portal that high school recruits sometimes get a little overlooked because they some people go and get more experienced players so what like with within your portal dive um how do you i guess work that Say that last part again. How do you work your portal dive? Like, what what does going in the portal, going portal shopping, window shopping, all that good thing? How does that work for you? Um, I guess for us, it's a little it's a little bit different than a lot of uh, different you know institutions across the country because we are a high academic uh, university. Um, so we firstly have to make sure that. Um, these young ladies that we're inquiring about are like-minded individuals in terms of like what they want to study, if we have what they want to study, and if they can get into school. Um, so for us, we we know that, you know, those fifth years in the Ivy League, a lot of them, you know, are looking for another place, you know, to play. Um, so that's kind of where we start first, and then we work our way, you know, elsewhere. Um, and we're, we're trying to just make sure that kids that we're reaching out to kind of fit the mold of what we do and how we play. Um, we just don't want to take anybody just, you know, for the sake of taking people, if it's not a quick necessity of what we need. Uh, we're, we, we took a young lady last year. She transferred to us from Hampton. Um, so she was kind of the luck of the draw. She was right down the road from this area. Um, and she came to us this year and ended up being, you know, the leading scorer in the CAA and I think the best free throw shooter in the CAA. Um, so we know we're not going to get another her um, just because she came a dime a dozen and she, you know, was a 5'10 post player who played like a guard. So her skill set was just God given. Um, but we do know we can find some pieces to kind of how we play and we try to just work our way through the portal. Um, in that regard, and each coach, you know, takes the portal each day of the week, and we all kind of just fill in and see what we're looking for, and reach out to as many as many kids as we can, because we do know we're operating on a smaller scale, a scale than most. How about you, Coach Crawford? Um, <clears throat> so I think I think the biggest thing about the portal um, and kind of approaching it is just have an idea of what you need for next season um, and what you need long term. And, um, you know, similar to Kenia, like GW is a high academic school. And so you're, you're looking for um, players that can, that can do the work, obviously help you compete for an A-10 championship, um, you know, and then while fitting in with like the, the student body at, at GW and, you know, that they're, they're worldly, they have, um, you know, that they're not going to, to not necessarily stick out, but just where they, you know, they'll feel at home, they'll feel comfortable. And so that's all the work that you do on the back end. Um, but on the front end, you're just, you're looking at stats. Honestly, you're looking at what are your needs, you're looking at positions. So it's similar to, um, I mean, it's similar to, for me, it's similar to any other type of recruiting. The most um, the biggest difference and the biggest, um, uh, I'm not sure of the word, but that, that requires the most attention is how quickly they're making decisions and how you have to speed up your process of recruiting. And you have to be very diligent about the player you're recruiting. And so you have to do a lot of research in a very short amount of time. You know, like when you're recruiting high schoolers, you have three, four years for some um, to get to know them and to get to know their family and to get and to grow with them. Right. And this time, like we're trying to get kids signed in, um, you know, two to three weeks and four weeks. Right. And so you're trying to learn as much as you can. in such a short window of time. You're trying to bring them on campus uh, because now it's a race and not it, it. That's where it's a lot different than, uh, you know, under undergrad, sorry, um, high school recruiting or even like junior college recruiting where you're kind of doing that you know, over the course of one to two years, but over the course of um, a season at least. Um, and I, I do think that there are some times where, um, I, I'll say this, if there are high schoolers that are listening um, or that people are 
parents of high schoolers or just make sure your kid is taking care of what they need to take care of and they'll they'll find a school right like continue to to work continue to get in the gym um go to college basketball games go to as many basketball games as you can go to as many camps as you can as, as you can afford make as many highlight tapes as you have time to do um play basketball play basketball play basketball and i guarantee you, you'll you'll get noticed and so you don't have to be concerned about um the portal um just take care of you as they say just run run your own race um so i just want to say that that message out there um to kind of answer your second question b uh to piggyback off of what Dre said uh another thing that people also have to be wary of in terms of speed when navigating the portal um a lot of these kids are trying to get into grad school so these deadlines are approaching so a lot of them are trying to move fast especially when they're fifth years you know trying to get a one year like MBA or anything like a one year grad degree they are they are cognizant of the the deadlines that that come with that okay so um, we've heard a lot of, um, you know, some use the portal to, a lot of people use the portal to their advantage, but we've also heard that, you know, there are some personal, I guess, beliefs in some tweaks that could be made. Um, is there anything with the portal that you would like to see change? Or is there any, like, you know, like, drop your suggestion box as you leave the door? Like, what's one thing that you like to see maybe improve with the portal experience? Um, I guess I just wish that each kid knew that you can put your phone number in it. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so they, so like, do they just Please. email address? I mean, there's an email address and then you got it. Like, there's a whole extensive amount of research you have to do to try and get, like, you're looking it, for Instagram, yeah. you're looking for Twitters, you're looking yeah. for all these things you're trying to call your friends at the schools and that coach them like hey can i get so-and-so's number can i like you're doing all of that um all of that work i would probably lean more um towards that i also this is just a work-life balance you can't get in the portal after 5 p.m like nine to five that's the only time you can get in the portal you gotta wait till nine the next day to get in the portal so that would just be my personal take. I don't know how other people feel about it, but that would be my hot take. <laughs> yeah, because I'm with these kids every day, and the amount of times I have to say, hey, did you check your email today? I know <laughs> that these kids are going in and they had their email addresses. Well. Some of them probably not checking their email. So I know you on that phone because you got it on D&D, so <laughs> I can notify you anyway. You really feel so, like his mama. <laughs> I, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I would love to text a kid and say they got their notification silence. I would hit notify anyway. But I think that most of them probably don't know that you can put your phone number. I think it would kind of speed things up, especially if a lot of these kids are on, you know, some sort of time constraint with being inside of the portal. Got and it, also appreciate it. the ones who go in there and have do not contact me. I'm cool with that. Because <laughs> like, I know where I'm going. You don't even got the bother, Shawty. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> and we've seen several in service uh, <laughs> this week. Do not contact. All right? I'm wearing orange or I'm wearing blue. All right. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, so um, any questions from the committee to our coaches? We're going to open this part up. Uh, to any audience questions, we thank you all for listening so far. Y- y'all know always we like to get off here by like nine o'clock. So, oh well, sorry. That's we time. started at nine o'clock Eastern, Brandon. I'm sorry. We, we like to get thank off you. by eight Pacific. So, what um what any questions? Anyone want to raise your hand? The committee. Y'all have anything for the coaches before we let them go? Mm-mm, no. If anything, just thank y'all because. I always love these ones. These are my favorite spaces just because I feel like we learn so much um, about how y'all think the game and just how y'all process what y'all are seeing. Because, I like, you guys are also fans of the game. Like, it's your job. But, like, I like the excitement that y'all have about watching the games, which is just like we have. So um, that I, that's been the most enjoyable part um, about the space is just, like, listening to y'all being fans as well. Um, of the of the games, even Coach Brooks and um, Coach Neighbors. The heck, I miss Coach Neighbors. He is so funny. Boy, we was in here cracking up. He had too many um, bourbons. Um. 
<laughs> well, that is hilarious. <laughs> hold on, right quick. Um, before <clears throat> I, you know, I always gotta let us go out with a song, but before we do, I just want to say thank you to Coach Neighbors, thank you, um, to newly um, announced uh, head coach of Utah State University, Coach Wes Brooks. Thank you, Coach Cole and Crawford. Um, we really appreciate you all for joining us. Um, it's been really, really, really exciting. And as always, before we get out of here, thank you for being there. Whoa, yeah. <laughs> Say the start. started from the bottom, now we're here, girl. Ooh. You're a pal and a confidant. We're not trying to get, we're not trying to get any licensing issues, so thank <laughs> y'all for tuning in. Uh, we will definitely be on Spaces and, excuse me, on Playback this week, watching the Final Four for all of the coaches in here. Um, we look forward to seeing you all in Cleveland. I'm going to be at the ball with y'all, so I'm going to come and holler. And um, thank y'all always, and thank you for listening. Thank us for speaking. Peace out. Bye. Bye.